Wheaton's Tower Talks, of course, seem to be riffing off, not ripping off, but riffing off the phenomenon of the technology, entertainment, and design conference addresses, which we know as TED Talks. And so let me begin by riffing off one of them. I'm referring to a TED Talk by Thomas Campbell, the director and CEO of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And in it, he described his first art course taught by Pietro, an erasable Italian who drank and swore too much. Pietro places this slide on the screen and asks his class what it is. The future Met director, then student, replied correctly that it is a bacchanal. But Pietro barks back, what? Bacchanal? You bookworm. It's an orgy. With a colorful adjective added before orgy that I'm not going to use here. It was a really effective setup for a TED Talk. It certainly got my attention. And it nicely conveyed Campbell's point that we shouldn't let art historical terminology get in the way of our visceral experience with art. Don't let your academic expectations conceal from you the obvious. Trust your instincts. That's great advice. So let's try it. But with a different Titian painting. Because Titian painted our Bacchanal, or orgy, in his mid-30s. But he painted this one in his 80s. And the first thing we might say about it, with due respect to Pietro, is it's not an orgy. It was left unfinished at Titian's death. Indeed, it was intended to be placed by the artist's own tomb. The motif, of course, is the Pieta, Mary holding her dead son. And the apse above them is an image of the pelican pecking itself to feed its starving young with its own blood, an image of Christ's sacrifice for our sin. On the right is Jerome, penitent at the feet of Jesus, but it sure does look a lot like Titian. And in the corner is another self-portrait of Titian with his son before another Pieta, a Pieta within a Pieta, as one art historian puts it. And it's as if Titian is saying, enough with images. I want to break through them to encounter the spiritual realities themselves. And pleased with this devotion, the woman on the left that patron saint of penitence, Mary Magdalene, has her hands raised as if she's saying, stop, don't judge him yet. The story of Tiziano Vecellio, painter of orgies, isn't over yet, because he just repented. What I'd like to suggest in this talk is very similar to Thomas Campbell's suggestion. It's that art historical terminology and the general biases of scholars and curators can obscure but it can obscure an equally obvious feature of human experience, something that is at least as common as orgies. In fact, what I'm describing might actually be a good follow-up to an orgy. Repentance. And repentance can be beautiful. Many of us have in our mind an image of artists as rebels who break the rules, just as we have in our mind an image of Victorian British intellectuals who had agonizing agonizing crises of faith. But Wheaton's Tim Larson has shown that the opposite phenomenon was more common in Victorian England. Skeptics who had crises of doubt and converted back to Christianity. And maybe we can make a similar argument for artists. I'm not saying there isn't abundant evidence for artists violating moral boundaries. The painter Fra Filippo Lippi was well known for his sexual escapades and even had an illegitimate son with a nun. Artists gone wild. But less discussed is the fact that that very son, Filippino Lippi, rebelled against dad by getting involved in reform circles in Florence and by depicting the penitent John the Baptist and Magdalene to counter that city's decadence. Artists gone mild. Or take, for example, the young Donatello, who, although he gave us tantalizing sculptures such as this one, David has conquered Goliath, but the tickling feather creeps up the boy's thigh. But he then, Donatello, seems to cancel it out with his penitent Magdalene later on. 
For better or for worse, the 16th century author, Giorgio Vasari, is our chief source for these famous Renaissance figures. I think he frequently displays a tin ear for the religious backdrop to the artists that he chronicles. But even Vasari tells us this about one of his famous painters. Quote, in his old age, he lay sick for several months and feeling that he was near death, he earnestly resolved to learn about the doctrines of the good and holy Christian religion. Then, lamenting bitterly, he confessed and repented, end quote. That was Leonardo da Vinci. And by the way, I just saved you the need to watch the TV series because you now know how it's going to end. Now, it's better, of course, to repent before your deathbed. And we at Wheaton know a good bit about that. I was on campus two decades ago at the 1995 Wheaton Revival where weeping students voluntarily brought their contraband, explicit CDs, pornography, illegal drugs, to the floor of Pierce Chapel, where it was then deposited in a pickup truck and brought to the dump with the driver praying to God, please don't let me get pulled over. <laughs> and this event can help us understand the bonfire of the vanities that happened 502 years earlier, lit by Savonarola's preaching in Florence. Those citizens brought their contraband to be destroyed as well. And legend has it that Alessandro Botticelli, painter of The Birth of Venus, may have placed some of his paintings in the fire. Vasari is annoyed at this. He tells us that Botticelli was a great painter, but then he got mixed up with Savonarola and began to waste his time illustrating Dante's Inferno, which is to say after his conversion, Botticelli fell out of fashion. As many of you know, Savonarola, so beloved by Martin Luther, took things too far. After establishing a Florentine theocracy, he made the mistake of attacking the Pope's luxurious lifestyle and ultimately the Florentines finding Savonarola's moral rigor, true stringent, burned him at the stake, just like he once burned the vanities. Taste of his own medicine, the Florentines must have thought. But in this one mysterious image that survives of the event, I like to think of Botticelli as the young man in the front, kind of like the boy who flees the crucifixion in the Gospel of Mark. And if that is Botticelli, where is he running off to? He's going to the studio to paint the kind of images that Savonarola called for, paintings that are almost direct illustrations of Savonarola's sermons. Again, Pietà. Vasari was wrong. The penitent Botticelli gave us some of the best paintings of his career. And believe it or not, the same life trajectory applies to the most famous Renaissance artist of all. Like the character in one of Henry James's novels, we have romanticized Michelangelo. We long to, quote, commune with the spirit of Buonarroti as the south wind blows from Florence at midnight, end quote. But the spirit of Buonarroti is the spirit of repentance, a fact nicely conveyed by contrasting his optimistic Adam from the first part of the Sistine Chapel to the ruined Adam of the Last Judgment. Recent studies, and these are brilliant books, have established that Michelangelo turned to the ancient Christian icon as a way of critiquing Renaissance artistic excess. He struck up a spiritual friendship with the powerful noblewoman, Vittoria Colonna, who drove this perfectionist artist to simpler icons, which were, as she put it, manco e imperfetto, partial and imperfect. Vittoria was a member of the Spirituale, a mediating party between Protestants and hardline Catholics. And Michelangelo, believe it or not, was their official illustrator. These private drawings for the Spirituale are outside the economy of paid commissions. They are free gifts intended to communicate the free gift of salvation in Christ. And this theme shows up in sculpture as well. In this haunting deposition, we see the penitent Mary Magdalene again on the left, the Virgin Mary on the right, but she's not as prominent. As one art historian put it, the older Michelangelo, quote, shifted the emphasis in the Pietà from the Virgin's experience 
to Christ's gift, end quote. And at the top, there's a switch out. Michelangelo places himself where Mary once was because he's the one who needs God's grace the most. Now, yes, it is Nicodemus, that figure holding Jesus, the patron saint of sculptors, but it is also a self-portrait of Michelangelo. And Nicodemus, you'll know from the New Testament, came to Christ in secret. Is this Michelangelo suggesting that he is in that persecuted reformist circle, the spirituali, but he's afraid to admit it? Alexander Nagel has argued that when Michelangelo said, grazia divina non si pio comparare, divine grace cannot be bought, he was drawing on Protestant ideas about grace. Not surprising then, at Wheaton we have a similar image among the Stations of the Cross in the Billy Graham Center's fifth floor. It is modeled appropriately after Michelangelo. And it too is a self-portrait of the artist. Our photographer, Greg Schreck, with his son, Theo. These themes of Michelangelo's life intensified as he got older. Here is his last work, the Rondonini Pietà, executed in his 90s devoid of virtuosity, yet it amazingly manages to depict that it isn't Mary who holds Jesus. <laughs> it's Jesus who, even in his death, holds her. Now, some of you might be thinking it's one thing to prove this phenomenon of repentance in the 15th and 16th century when religion was more in the air. But what about our own secular age? Well, it might actually be easier. Maybe there's more to repent of. In fact, we could match each of the Renaissance penitent artists with modern ones, and not insignificant modern ones either. Maybe Titian could go with Andy Warhol. I remember as a freshly graduated art history major from Wheaton walking into the Soho Guggenheim Gallery in New York to see Warhol's Last Supper series. And the lesson seemed to be, and I was skeptical, but the lesson seemed to be that no matter how many commercial logos one plasters over the Last Supper, no matter how many times the images are twisted, colored, or copied, Christ's gesture of self-sacrificing love is tirelessly constant. In her book, The Religious Art of Andy Warhol, Jane Dillenberger says that in this series, quote, the cool and distant artist abandoned his mask. Warhol finally created paintings in which his secret but deeply religious nature flowed into his art. End quote. And maybe Botticelli could be matched up with Hugo Ball and Emmy Hennings. And they might not be so familiar to you. But Hal Foster, a ranking expert on the movement known as Dada, has recently suggested that, suggested that Ball is even more important than Marcel Duchamp for understanding this hugely art influential artistic movement. As a brilliant college student in Munich, Ball grew obsessed with Nietzsche, even penned a dissertation on him. But he then gave up on academia without a degree and turned to the radical theater. He met an itinerant actress and nightclub performer named Emmy. But when Ball visited the Belgian front and got a taste of what would later be called the First World War, he was so disgusted by what he saw that he gave up on the radical theater as well. It wasn't enough to respond to total war. Emmy forged them some passports. They moved to neutral Zurich, and these were the wild nights of the Cabaret Voltaire, where all known artistic rules were cast aside. Here's Ball dressed in his cubist costume with one of his deliberately nonsensical poems printed below. He calls himself here the magical bishop. See how his hat resembles a mitre. And when he went on stage to recite his meaningless poetry, the words culminated in something nearly liturgical, almost a priestly incantation. He was so overcome that he collapsed and had to be carried off the stage. He had tapped into something that then went viral. Berlin, Cologne. Paris, New York. As one art historian puts it, Ball's whim became an international sensation. But then he had his Botticelli moment. 
I can imagine a time where I will seek obedience as much as I have tasted disobedience, he wrote in 1915. He began studying the great Christian desert saints of Byzantium. Ball concluded that Christianity is the only avant-garde that stands any chance of succeeding. He and Emmy were married, and they returned to the church. For Hugo and Emmy, the last and greatest Dada performance was their own repentance. And it's no wonder that when secular Dada-loving art critics today speak admiringly of Hugo and Emmy, they have to warn people, but don't go that far. Perhaps these critics are nervous because they know that Hugo is hunting them. As he wrote in a letter to a priest, quote, I want to bring souls along with me. I want to bring many, many souls. And if not from this generation, then from the next. Well, if Dada is the major 20th century artistic movement, a close second might be surrealism. So why not pair Salvador Dali with Michelangelo? Dali would be very pleased by that comparison. Now, he's part of a radical filmmaking group that attracted the attention of the surrealists. There he is, smack in the center of the in crowd circa 1930. A skilled painter, he gave us some of the movement's most enduring images, but Dali's fame led to jealousy. And André Breton ultimately kicked Dali out of the Surrealist movement because Dali was not sufficiently on the political left. But no matter, Dali then declared himself a classic painter. His 1942 autobiography, The Secret Life of Salvador Dali, contains these words, quote, At this moment I do not yet have faith, and I fear I shall die without heaven, end quote. In fact, that's how the book ends. And it's also how a lot of Dali's scholarship ended until very recently. But then you might say Dali was born again. As he puts it in his mystical manifesto, the decadence of modern painting was a consequence of skepticism and lack of faith, the result of mechanistic materialism. Modern art painted nothing because it believed in nothing and Dali was done with nothing. There was a purported exorcism in 1947. He gave addresses entitled, Why I Was Sacrilegious, Why I Am a Mystic. He was advised by a Catholic priest, Father Bologna, about St. John of the Cross, that great Spanish mystic, whose visions Dali then illustrated. Like Botticelli, Dali found himself illustrating Dante as well. And it's not that he gives up surrealist imagery, he just finds a place for it the place where such contortions have always been in the Christian tradition, in hell. Now, Dali's post-conversion life was still messy. It reminds me of the title to one of his paintings, Explosion of Mystical Faith in the Midst of a Cathedral. But even though Dali was, as I like to put it, professionally weird, I think you could teach an effective catechism using his work alone. Catechisms are built on the creed, so let's give it a shot. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and so on. But despite all this, Dali never got one official church commission. Some Christians were afraid to get involved, but we should. Because were it not for the preaching of Savonarola, the spiritual friendship of Vittoria Colonna, or the counsel of Father Bologna, the changes in these artists might not have happened. Another example of such involvement is Tom Banchoff, a Catholic math professor who recently came to Wheaton's campus because he trained one of our math professors, Steve Lovett. Banchoff was friends with Dali and discussed the mathematics of the hypercube with him, which Dali is holding here, clinging to it. A hypercube is a cube from the fourth dimension, very difficult to visualize. But when it unfolds in our three dimensions, intriguingly, it looks like a cross. 
And Dali turned this mathematical fact into a meditation on the eternal truth that when heavenly love hits this world, its shape is cruciform. In his staggeringly good book, The Beauty of the Infinite, David Bentley Hart wrote this, quote, The Imago Dei, the image of God within us, is not simply a possession of the soul, so much as a future. The self, forever displaced and exceeded by its desire for God, is a self displaced toward an image. That makes the particular self always reinterpretable. The soul is a story that can always be retold, converted, end quote. I hope I've shown that some of the best art history confirms Hart's insight which lends hope to the art that is out there now. I certainly wouldn't want to undersell how bad things can be in certain art world sectors, as represented, in my opinion, by Jeff Koons. But seeing that Koons both met and was continually inspired by Dali, maybe Jeff Koons' penitent phase is yet to come. And we eagerly await his mystical manifesto. That might seem far-fetched, but isn't it also far-fetched to say that the author of The Wasteland, a poem that defined a disaffected generation, would convert to Anglicanism? Or that the singer-songwriter who defined his generation would make a heartfelt evangelical album? Or that the editor of Poetry Magazine would end up writing a profound theological autobiography. Yet that's precisely what happened to T.S. Eliot, Bob Dylan, Bob Dylan, and most recently, Christian Wyman. What I've tried to argue here is that Thomas Campbell is right. People perceive the museum and its justifier, art history, as a stuffy discipline. And the job of a good curator or art historian is to break down those walls. As Campbell puts it, our scholarship can tell us that this is a bacchanal, but trust your instinct. You know it's an origin. It's good counsel, but I hope that I've shown that it's fair to add just two words to the Met director's statement. Trust your instinct. You know it's an orgy. For now. Thank you.